For over half a century, Canada has been a world leader in the production, use, and development of life-saving medical isotopes. The world is counting on Canada to expand this leadership role to support the diagnosis and treatment of cancer, ensuring medical equipment is safe for use, and to tackle some of our greatest challenges in health sciences. Welcome to the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council's Isotopes for Hope podcast with your host, James Skoniak, Chair of the CNIC. In this series, we interview Canadian leaders who are making a difference every day. We hope you enjoy this episode of the Isotopes for Hope podcast. So welcome everybody to the Isotopes for Hope podcast today. I'm thrilled to have Catherine Hayashi join us today. And Catherine is the president and CEO of Triumph Innovations. And for those of you that, that, that may not be familiar with Triumph Innovations, they are really the interface and commercialization arm that link together Canada's particle accelerator, which you know we'll talk to Catherine more about this, but I think is actually the largest, uh, one of the largest particle accelerators uh, in the world, um, with organizations to 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 really commercialize um, and develop this sector. And it's a uh, it's not only a Canadian gem, uh, Triumph Innovations, but it's in particular something I know people in the province of British Columbia are uh, are particularly proud of. Uh, in addition to Catherine's leadership. Uh, as the president and CEO of Triumph Innovations. She's also a member of the board and, and a founding member, I should say, of the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council, but has also led a, a group uh, between Triumph, uh, CPDC, Bruce Power, uh, the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council, um, to really establish Canada's medical isotope ecosystem. And that's, a, that's an ecosystem that's put in place to really deploy um, very uh, important government funding that has been set aside to to really uh, advance the sector. Uh, on, a, on a personal uh, note, prior to uh, her tenure as the president and CEO of Triumph Innovations, uh, she was the founding chief financial officer um, of the Center for Drug Research uh, and Development uh, and has uh, just, just an outstanding background as a, as a business, not-for-profit and community leader. So thank you very much for joining us today, Catherine. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, really looking forward to the discussion. So let, let's start with Triumph. So, um, you know, as you know, I'm based in central Canada. And oftentimes in central Canada, when we talk about isotopes, we we talk about our, our commercial power reactors and our research reactors. And, and don't get me wrong, we're really proud of those. Um, but we have uh, a, another Canadian gem on the west coast uh, of Canada that is globally recognized. So you can talk a little bit about so firstly, the accelerator there, sort of, you know, what it means in historical context for Canada, and and also what it, what is Triumph Innovations' role uh, in that very, uh, I think, outstanding piece of Canadian uh, medical infrastructure. Sure. So, uh, so Triumph has a long history in nuclear medicine and medical isotopes. Triumph itself is over fifty years old. Uh, it's home to over six hundred staff and students, um, many of whom work on things like they're looking for dark matter studying antimatter, uh, developing new quantum materials, but there are a bunch of folks here that work on medical isotopes. And that work is really important to Triumph. Um, the health outcomes, uh, creating economic opportunities, training the next generation of scientists and engineers that work in this space. And we've been producing for over 40 years medical isotopes for researchers and patients in Canada and around the world. Um, as you mentioned, we have the largest cyclotron in the world, and there's you can see a picture of it behind me. Uh, this is a picture that was taken during the construction before the lid was put on. Um, but it, as you can see from all the people sitting on it, it's, it's huge. It's over 18 meters in diameter. It's a 520 million electron volt uh, cyclotron. So it's a very special piece of infrastructure. It's recognized as one of the engineering wonders of the world. Uh, you know, we have tours of the of the cyclotron in the facility. And in fact, as Canada's Particle Accelerator Center, there's just one of the cyclotrons that we have on the site. We have uh, five cyclotrons now, and there'll be a sixth one uh, by the end of the year. Um, they're everything from the 520 and million electron volt one down to a, we had our smallest one is the 13 million electron volt cyclotron. And some of these smaller ones, the TR13, we call it there. We also have a TR24. We have two TR30s. So 
um, these Triumph cyclotrons are have really been the workhorses for many organizations in Canada around the world. Lots of Triumph, um, the TR cyclotrons, which are sold by ACSI, uh, the TR stands for Triumph because they are based on Triumph design. So we're really proud of the role that we've played in um, isotopes really for the past uh, 50 years. Um, we also have developed a really strong life sciences division. The life sciences division has over 50 staff and students working on really cutting edge new ideas, new isotopes, trying to understand um, what they can be used for uh, in terms of new imaging and new treatments, uh, developing new linkers and chelators or the things that actually hold the isotope in in a therapeutic drug. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's been a really exciting place. Wow. And I think we're really proud of, of the role that we played in Canada and, uh, and globally in the, in the isotope story. Well, I think I think you're absolutely right. Uh, haven't had the opportunity to tour it a number of years ago, and look forward to getting out there again. It 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 is a real icon of Canadian innovation, and uh, something we as Canadians should be be really proud of. And, and maybe building on that, Catherine, can you guys sort of level set for people um, how you use the infrastructure today? So the types of isotopes you're producing, uh, the types of isotopes you also hope to continue expanding, and and Really, what treatments are those isotopes used for from an end patient perspective? I think a lot of the work that we've done, maybe I should just back up a little bit. You know, one of the things that really put Triumph on the map for the medical isotope story was um, several years ago when it was announced that the NRU reactor was shutting down and the world was very concerned about a global technetium shortage. And technetium is still the most commonly used imaging isotope in the world. Um, so, you know, Many people were trying to find different ways to produce technetium. And one of the things that Triumph did was build a consortium and develop a technology um, that you could, instead of using uh, a nuclear reactor um, or a big cyclotron, you could produce technetium using a tabletop cyclotron that could be located in the in the basement of a regional hospital. And we uh, developed that technology. We uh, spun it off into a company called Artemis. Uh, so Artemis is now kind of the vehicle to take that that uh, technology out in, into the world. Uh, I think I think, uh, thankfully, the technetium shortage that we were all worried about uh, years ago didn't materialize. There have been lots of different sources of te technetium coming on board, but that same technology can be used with different targets to produ produce new isotopes, for example, gallium and copper, um, you know, things that are more in demand and, and we're seeing a growing demand for. Um, so I, I think, you know, that, that history of taking a problem, uh, putting our, our infrastructure, resources, expertise to solving them and coming up with new technologies and getting those technologies out into the world is something that we we do and we're really proud of. Uh, what we've been doing the past few years has really been focused on getting actinium-225 production up and running. Uh, we have um, developed in partnership with uh, with CNL and with our partners BWXT, with um, f assistance from Fusion Pharmaceuticals, a real Canadian approach to um, increasing the world supply of an isotope that looks like it is going to be very important for treating cancers in the future. Uh, the problem, as as you might, as I'm sure you know, uh, there's only enough current supply of actinium-225 for a few thousand patients a year. And we're seeing incredible results in prostate cancer in patients that have failed conventional therapies. Right. So we need to figure out a way to increase that to uh, tens and thousands of doses uh, a year. And uh, so we've been successful in scaling up our production. We have a, a partnership with uh, BWXT Medical. Uh, so the, the cyclotron we use here, um, because of its size and, and the and the very special infrastructure that we have, we can produce more actinium-225 on our cyclotron than anyone else in the world. Um, and, and we're also working on a, a new method that would require only a small cyclotron. So we need to kind of develop a new technology, right. again, to solve that same technical problem. Um, so I, I think that's really 
what we do here. Um, we're really proud of a partnership uh, now with BWXT Medical that has supplied um, over 50 million doses of medical isotope to patients in Canada and around the world over the decades. Uh, and again, you know, working with partners is something that we're really proud of. Um, you know, we are a good organization to partner with. We do do incredible discovery research, but we also have people that are uh, a whole team of people that are dedicated to commercial production uh, of isotopes at Triumph. Yeah, Catherine, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, your work, BWXT's work, uh, CNL, your, your your partners, the ability for Canada to really be able to continue to expand that production of actinium-225, it, it's just so important for patients. And, you know, your, your leadership is, is instrumental in that. Maybe building on this uh, conversation around partnerships, it's it's been a theme across uh, the, the, the various podcasts, you know, one, one of the areas that, that um, you and the Center for Probe Development and Commercialization led was work with the Government of Canada uh, through the Strategic Innovation Fund. Catherine, can you maybe just talk about um, that, uh, that initiative, uh, that which I think is very historic and a, and a very important foundation of federal government support that I think, you know, came out a lot of a lot of the advocacy that the, that the sector came together in here. Maybe just walk people through a little bit of, you know, how, how do we plan to deploy that funding in a coordinated partnership form um, so, so we can really get the, the, the maximum benefit in terms of asserting Canada's role uh, in this space? Yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, Canada has been a leader. You know, I, I think we often say in Canada, because we're a small country in the world, you know, where do we punch above our weight? And um, and I think, you know, there are actually not that many areas where we do punch above our weight. You know, hockey, I think, is one of them, you know, curling. Um, but medical isotopes, for real, is a place where Canada has a big impact in the world. And I think the the community that has been built up in Canada in medical isotopes is one where, um, you know, it's pretty collegial. We all kind of know each other. We all work well together. And so when the government announced the creation of the strategic innovation funds, um, uh, several of us, and you were instrumental in those discussions, were um, came together and said, well, we should put forward an initiative based on our Canadian medical isotope uh, ecosystem. And we really wanted, again, because of strategic innovation funds, we really wanted to focus on innovation and finding the next generation of medical isotopes and, and finding a way for us to work together and for the government to play a role in pushing the and accelerating the commercialization success for Canada in, in that area. Um, so we had many meetings um, and we found an incredible group of projects um, that came from Bruce Power with um, partnered with the Saugin Ojibwe Nation, from CNL, from Triumph, from CPDC, uh, from McMaster. And um, we put together a, a proposal um, and presented it to the government. Uh, part of the proposal was also um, the request for additional funds so that we could uh, again, foster and accelerate more projects. There are um, incredible projects being developed by researchers uh, and clinicians and small companies all across Canada. So how can we kickstart those projects? It is such a struggle um, to get an early stage academic uh, project off the ground and to get the proof of concept data that you need for it to advance through commercialization. So if there was a role that we could play in finding and focusing resources on those projects, um, that that was something that we really thought was important. Uh, so we came together as a group. We um, did 100,000 meetings, I think, something like that, uh, with Ottawa and stakeholders. And, um, and we were really happy in June of 2023 to announce our program. So we received $35 million in funding from the federal government to do exactly that, to realize this vision of pushing uh, Canadian innovative medical isotope projects forward and to identify uh, a next generation of Canadian innovation and, and continue to build that pipeline of medical isotope uh, technologies for Canada. And Catherine, I think what's really exciting about that money is it, it's not a, it, it's really not just a, a, 
uh, a government uh, government grant and government investment only, the, the sectors really come together to to match that and to bring private sector investment. Uh, and I and I think I think that's a real part of the success rate because that's going to be critical critical for the sustainability. So, so Catherine, I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, you've um, uh, given the unique positioning of of Triumph. Obviously, I know you you keep a keen eye on the the global sort of radio pharmaceutical uh, picture and, and how how uh, how things are developing. And, and as I like, you know, since you started a Canadian uh, hockey analogy, I can we we like to find out where the puck is going, not not where the puck has been. And um, you know, if you if you sort of fast forward to ten years from now, it, you know, if we were having this this conversation in the mid twenty thirties. From a Canadian perspective, and most importantly, from a patient perspective, with the trajectory we're on and the opportunity we have, what, what do you think will be different? I think we have really, I mean, when I started here at Triumph and we really started to get interested in these new medical isotope cancer treatments. So what were the amazing results we're seeing with lutetium-177 and actinium-225 on, on prostate cancer patients, that was all new data, um, you know, five or six years ago. And I remember um, having been in the drug development business for about 20 years, I remember talking to some of my venture capital colleagues and telling them, hey, you know, radio pharmaceuticals, this is going to be the, like, look at this, look at this data, look at these patient scans. And they were like, radio pharmaceuticals, you know, and um, they were curious. It was like an interesting idea. And I um, talked to uh, one, one, a venture guy that I had met uh, several years ago, telling him that radio pharmaceuticals wasn't going to be the next big thing. Uh, and he actually said, you were absolutely correct. <laughs> and, you know, we've really seen the interest and uptake uh, spread from the research community into the venture community into big pharma. So now we're seeing every big pharma company pursuing their version of radio pharmaceutical development because they know it's an area where it's really going to make a difference for patients. And that, and that means that there's, there's market opportunity for them. Um, I think what we're going to see in the future, you know, we've seen a lot of great data about prostate. I think we're going to see more cancers, more hard to treat cancers and more hard to treat uh, diseases outside of cancer that are treatable with radio pharmaceuticals um, in a way that, you know, is, is going to offer patients new hope. And then I think it's also going to evolve from being a treatment that you get after you have failed have gone through chemotherapy, gone through radiotherapy, which are tough, tough treatments. Right. Um, and and then, you know, because you failed conventional therapy, then you're given an opportunity to try the radio pharmaceutical treatment. I think that the, it's going to move further up the treatment regime. So people won't have to wait um, until they've been battling cancer for a number of years before the radio pharmaceuticals are deployed. Um, I think we're going to start to see more combination therapies. So I think we're already kind of hearing, you know, some um, some innovative clinicians finding new ways to treat patients. Um, so I think that's just going to continue to grow. When you look at the impact um, and the specificity that people get, you know, where their cancer is, um, their cancer cells are destroyed, but their healthy tissue um, is is kept intact. I mean, that quality of life. And the extension of life that that offers is is really important, and so I think we're just going to continue to see growth into into other areas. Catherine, what's really amazing to me, and I, I totally agree with you. I, I think the, the the punch above our weight is a uh, is a is a really good way to frame this, and also as a country, pick, picking the areas that we can really move the dial internationally. And 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 one of the things that continues to impress me is the partnerships that you talked about the the ability for the isotope sector whether it's reactor based technologies cyclotron based technologies the entire community coming together and saying you know we want to do this for patients we we want to demonstrate canadian leadership and how organizations have really set aside what i would say are very minor differences to really unite and and and, and put a, a consolidated picture and action plan together. And I have to tell you, Catherine, I think that's rare in the world we live in today. 
I do. I, I, you know, I wonder, you know, is it something because we're Canadian or whether it's something about the industry that we work in, whether it's, you know, that the types of people that this attracts, it really is something special. And, um, you know, having met a few patients now that have received these treatments and it's really changed their lives, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. Um, you know, it is the early stages of development for many of these isotopes. And so, you know, we need to cheer each other on. We need to get more supply. Um, you know, I hope it's Triumph that supplies the market, but I'm actually uh, really glad for, for any of us to succeed because we need to get more supply so that more treatments will continue to be developed and, and more money will flow into this this sector of, of uh, health treatments. I think it's also important that, um, you know, in many ways, because, because I come from energy, I, I, I often compare things to the energy sector where oftentimes I think about uh, energy, one of the most important things for us to recognize is it doesn't matter where the clean energy comes from, we're going to need it all. <laughs> and I think, and I think you know, you, you said it best that we're going to need all of this supply. We need everything running at 100% capacity. And I, the fundamental concern is, is that the, the, the demand from patients around the world outstrips what we can we can provide. So Absolutely. we don't want supply to be a, a limitation. So, so Catherine, um, for for government, obviously government plays uh, an important role in this. From a independent regulator in the case of the CNSC, uh, federal policy, provincial policy, um, and you've been very involved in this and and quite instrumental in the CNIC in terms of our our, our work to to establish a a strong policy and regulatory framework. Um, if you were giving advice to the Prime Minister or Minister Champagne, and I, and I know you, you know, Prime Minister has visited your your location a number of years ago. Minister Champagne has been quite uh, quite, quite involved. W what advice would you have for government going forward in terms of where they should play, where they shouldn't play, from a national government point of view? What what is it we need most from the Canadian government? I mean, I think we've really, um, you know, we've done a lot of education of, of uh, many folks in the government over the past three or four years. And uh, the most recent visit to Ottawa, I, uh, you know, I literally was bumping into MPs in the hall and they were like, oh, you're the medical isotope people, you know. And so uh, so I think it's really rewarding the, the progress that we've made and the awareness that people have of it. But I think you know, all of us are seeing on a provincial and federal level the challenges that we see before us, right? And we have aging populations. We have, uh, and then when you have aging populations, so you know, what are the diseases that that older people suffer from? Cardiovascular diseases and cancers, and right. medical isotopes are incredibly important in diagnosis and treatments of cardiovascular disease and cancer. And again. Um, you know, Canada has an opportunity to leverage the investments that that we have made and the government has made in infrastructure. So there's about a billion dollars worth of infrastructure on the Triumph site that has been invested over the decades by the government. Um, the investments that have been made in uh, the the reactor infrastructure, the investments that have been made to create the Chalk River structures. You know, how do we? Um, take those past investments and leverage them to solve the problems of our future. And I think medical isotopes is something that really resonates. You know, we've all had um, scans where we've used medical isotopes to see whether um, we have a disease or a, a not. Um, many of us increasingly are getting treatments um, to, to help us resolve disease that are using isotopes. Um, and again, if this is a place where Canada can really be a world leader and, you know, as I said to many politicians, uh, one of the things that they worry about is they invest in companies and then the companies eventually get to a growth point and they leave. You know, they right. get relocated to the United States, the mm -hmm. production moves to China, you know, whatever it is. Um, the thing about re about cyclotrons and reactors is they're not going anywhere. You know, this cyclotron has been here for over 50 years and it's not going anywhere. And, you know, the reactor infrastructure that we have 
in uh, Ontario and other parts of Canada. Um, that's there. It's not going anywhere. And in fact, you know, we're, we're going to probably be adding to it as our clean energy requirements grow. So can we take those investments and leverage them into making medical isotopes and creating further jobs, economic opportunity and better health outcomes? I think it's, you know, it is a good story. Um, and I think politicians get it. You know, they understand that this is it's a it's a story that they can understand and and get behind. Um, when I talk to politicians in Ottawa after about half an hour of hearing me, you know, evangelize about medical isotopes, they're usually sold. You know, and then uh, and then if I can actually get them to make the trek out to Triumph, and when they see for themselves the infrastructure that the government has invested in over the decades and how we're now deploying it. Um, to to create uh, economic opportunities, I, I think it's a really great win win story. No, I, I think that's well said. Well, well, look, Catherine, we really appreciate your your time today on on this podcast, and I I do want to extend our thanks to to you and the entire team at Triumph for what you do every day. Um, you know, you make a difference in people's lives. All all of this work that that you are leading, that you're contributing to broadly across Canada, it is making a difference, and so. This is a fantastic Canadian success story, and it's a story that still has many chapters to be written. So we really appreciate your your time today, and, and thanks for everything that you do. Oh, thanks for the opportunity to tell our story. And, and of course, um, just a reminder that uh, Triumph is open for tours. It really is a remarkable place. So I just want to um, welcome the world to Triumph, and uh, and, and please come, come see us, and we're, we'd love to show you more about what we do. You can hold uh, uh, needles on your hand and they will stand yes. upright, if I remember Catherine, yes. right? So. Yes, the, the cyclotron generates um, a pretty uh, strong magnetic field and it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a great, um, it's a great impact feeling. And I, I, I think it really sort of drives home how, how science feels and how, you know, the, the wondrous things that we can do. Absolutely. A great symbol of hope for, for cancer patients and a great symbol of Canadian innovation. Well, thanks again, Catherine, and uh, look forward to continue working together. Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Canadian Nuclear Isotope Council Isotopes for Hope podcast with James Skoniak. Please share this podcast and follow us to stay in the loop. To learn more, please visit our website at canadianisotopes.ca.